Hello, and welcome to the Higher Association Europe's Development Business Resilience Webinar. My name is Paul Gaze, and I'm going to moderate today's webinar. And I'm joined today by Kevin Lucas from Lucas Johnson. I'm pleased to say this is the third in the planned series of four webinars. Previous topics have included supporting employees and businesses looking at the mental health of their workforce and assisting hiring rental organisations deal with COVID-19 through developing a social distancing practical guide. Since the beginning of the year, the whole world has been dealing with the spectre of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. And as your trade association, we are here to assist you offering objective advice, guidance and support. We continue to do this throughout the pandemic and our staff are on the case working from home to support you and your business. Now we're going to record this webinar for those of you who are unable to join us at this time and want to find out a little bit more about the matter. If you have any questions, if you look on your screen, uh, please submit them through the webinar button and we'll seek to address them at the end of the webinar. If there are any real burning questions, uh, we can we can pick them up as we as we go along, but ideally we'll do them at the end. We've got a specific session uh, to, uh, to to cover this. So I'm also delighted to advise that the Higher Association Europe members now have access to an e-learning platform. This will allow people to find further information and update their skills. And as we record this webinar, the first two modules have gone live. I'll mention this a little bit later on at the end of the webinar. But just to make you aware, we will create a learning module out of this particular webinar as well. It's important that we give members the opportunity to utilize things at whatever time suits them. So it's important that we got this opportunity for people to uh, to continue with the learning and, and catch things up at a later date. OK, on to today. I just want to give you an overview of Kevin's background just to try and help uh, set the scene of the professional we brought in to help us talk about this subject matter today. So Kevin Lucas is a chartered accountant of over 20 years with a diverse finance background. As a licensed and solvent practitioner, Kevin provides professional advice and empathetic support to the owners, managers, and lenders to and from companies across a variety of funding, turnaround, rescue, and insolvency platforms. He's equally adept in the niche areas of deceased insolvent estates, third sector restructurings, pension scheme deficits, fraud investigations, and court-appointed receiverships, as well as more traditional solvent liquidations, reorganizations, demergers, including Section 110 schemes, partnerships, or LLP insolvency, various voluntary arrangements, CVAs, PVAs, IVAs, liquidation, administration, receivership, HMRC debt negotiation, pre- and post-lending viability, and covenant reviews. His technical expertise and knowledge of the law its practical application and the approach to the courts is second to none when it comes to getting the optimum outcome for stakeholders it represents. Kevin's an Institute of Chartered Accountants in England, Wales member and an R3, that's the Trade Association for the UK Restructuring and Solvency Committee member. He's also at the forefront of proposing actual changes taking place in the areas of expertise, providing considered thought-provoking comments to any situation. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you'll see that uh, the experience that Kevin's going to bring to the table today as part of this webinar really does get across uh, you know, the knowledge and skills that's required in the industry to look after businesses today. Excellent. So, um, Kevin, I'd like to hand over to you now to tell us a little bit about what you've got planned for today uh, and give us an overview uh, of, of Lucas Johnson and then share with uh, share with uh, those on the, on, the, on the call today and those that will be... Uh, uh, watching the view back at a later date uh, while we're here today. Thank you, Kevin. Lovely. Thank you, Paul, and thank you to the HAE to give me the, uh, the opportunity to come and talk to you to uh, hopefully uh, give you some good news um, in light of all the bad news that's out there at the moment and some thoughts for the future of the business. I think if I sort of talk over the, the next two slides as one, um, obviously, lovely introduction there from Paul. Thank you very much indeed. But, but why am I here? Why am I presenting this to you? Well, I've seen something like 5,000 businesses across my entire career. I've seen their systems, processes, the things they do well, the things they don't do well. And for those that have failed, I've reviewed and analyzed why they failed. It's rarely what they tell you. It's rarely what those directors believe to be the problem. But this gives me an invaluable insight into where they could have built resilience into their business model. The half an hour or so that I've got to speak um, and the 15 minutes at the end is far from enough time to go through all this inevitably, but hopefully the next half an hour will give you food for thought and some little projects to take away. I'm hoping in some respects that most of what I have to say 
isn't that earth shattering? But I'm a firm believer that sometimes it just takes somebody else to point out the easy or the obvious for it to sink in. So in essence, um, I would say, here we go. Um, if we could move forward a couple of slides, Paul, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so in analyzing your own business, in essence, why would you do it? Why do you need to analyze it? Why be concerned and why do this now? Well, it's been forecasted that a 20% contraction in the economy is a very realistic possibility. The government have obviously tried to avoid this with the stimulus options they've announced. This recession, though, should not be like the last, which started, like every other recession, with a very large fall, but then we flatlined, rather than emerging at a very quick but steady pace. But nobody knows what's actually going to happen this time. For example, if we lose millions or even hundreds of thousands of jobs, we simply cannot bounce back quickly as demand will have disappeared. However, if this recession does follow all by the last one, then there will be a quick bounce back. But it is in the bounce back phase that tens of thousands of businesses will cease to exist. That's what's happened for the last goodness knows how many decades and can't see it changing if we do bounce back quickly. Analyzing your business, though, is not all about looking at finance. There are a number of key areas to consider and we'll touch on those in a minute. But how often should you analyze your business? Well, you shouldn't just do it the once. The world changes at such a rapid pace, that even without coronavirus, you needed to be continuously reviewing the position. Now, the uncertainty of what the future will look like and when things will come back means analyzing your business more often is more important than ever before. Your analysis does not have to follow a particular method. You've probably all heard of a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is quite an old model nowadays, but regardless of what model or method you use, it's all about analyzing where you are, where you want to get to, and the hurdles or easy wins that can help you get there. What can you get out of analyzing your business? Might just be some reassurance, all is okay. It might be confirmation that sadly your business won't work, or that it needs to improve further, or just to survive, you've got to do whatever this is for whatever reason. You also need to think about and focus on the reasons that you're in business to begin with. Is it to provide a better life for you and your family? Is it to even escape your family and spend every possible waking minute working? Um, whatever it is, I would suggest that you need to think about your motivation for getting up every day for doing what you do and allow that motivation to shape the results. The resilience you're going to build into your business will, will entail. If you don't do that, I don't see why we're, um, you're going to have a business in the future. The resilience might not just be about your business. It might be about you. Sometimes having help and support around you, maybe the thing that comes out of the analysis you perform just shows you're lacking. Once you have analysed your business, though, and consider what your motivation is for doing what you do, one option might be to think about joining forces with somebody else. Having a smaller slice of a bigger pie and having less overhead or somebody else to share the burden with might actually be quite appealing. I think we're often you know, not keen to collaborate. We're often not keen to think about mergers because it might be our little business or our big business. But sometimes that is a really key way for getting through hard times. In the alternative, you may find that once you've taken a good look at your business, that you can see other opportunities such as making an acquisition. Your business might be in such a strong position that you think, let's see how we can grow and move forward that way. Now, some may not like thinking this way, but there will be acquisition opportunities out there that are gonna be coming up in the next 24 months for you to pick up alien competitors as well. As I say, for some, that's the way they want the business model to run, and for others, I do appreciate, they just don't like the thought of that. Now, when you're analyzing your options, what are the key areas you should look at? Well, there are seven key areas on the screen. Firstly, staff, you know, think about who do you need? I mean, who do you really need? You know, having dead bodies, having people that just aren't pulling their weight, do you really need those people? Do you have the right staff in the right roles? Who have you furloughed? Have you furloughed enough? Have you furloughed the right people? What is going to be the impact of COVID-19 on the motivations of those people going forward? Being paid 80% to sit at home versus being paid 100% to be back at work possibly working long hours, possibly being away from family and friends, may see a lot more people leaving their existing jobs. Now, more than ever, I think you need to consider the personality profiles of your teams, how they gel together, whether they suit working your business. For example, a necessary personality trait of somebody in my business is a compliant individual, given all the laws and regulations that we have to adhere to. For you, 
having somebody who prefers, say, working at a desk inside might not actually be the right person to head a team of installers out on site all the time. But until you've worked out what their personalities are, you might not realise that and you might have the wrong people in the wrong roles. I would consider profiling them right now whilst they're furloughed because they're not permitted to work, but they are permitted to train. And profiling them can be considered training, so you won't be breaking any of the rules. But if people do leave in the future because they've got different priorities now, how are you going to replace them quickly and easily? One of the simple things you can do now is having those job specifications and adverts ready. It's a crucial part of building resilience into the changes that may be heading towards your business. And there's a real risk that those changes are going to be great when it all kicks back in. You should also consider how your working practices might change to make it more appealing for your staff to stay with you and go to a competitor. I think there's going to be great pressure on all of us to change what we do and how we do it. But I'm not really too sure we've all got the answers yet, but we just need to build it into our planning and our resilience. And then turn to your suppliers. Who are your suppliers? How are they faring in the current environment? And what happens if they go out of business? What happens if their own suppliers have production shortages or logistical delays? Can you quickly and easily switch to someone else? I mean, do you have a list of everybody who supplies the items your business needs? Do you know their pricing? Is it worth having a look around and seeing who is competitively matched on price and whether somebody else would be better? I would be using the downtime you may well have now to go around and start doing these comparisons. Because when business picks up, you're simply not going to have the free time. What happens, as I said before, if they go out of business? Well, you obviously need to look at alternative supplies or what you could do to replace that item with something else that would keep your clients happy. What about spares? You know, are you likely to be able to get replacement parts if a particular supplier goes out of business? Not wholly relevant to you, but one thing that always sticks in my mind is to do with TVRs and what happened when they went. Trying to get parts for TVR was an absolute nightmare. Not that I had one, it just always sticks in my mind. Um, but if you do need to find alternatives, how quickly can that be sourced? You know, what about your own suppliers and their own PPE and social distancing issues? How does that affect their ability to supply? So do look around, do consider who you've got, who is out there, who you can switch to as a quick alternative. Turning to your customers, you know, most people look at their customers and think all we need to consider about is will they buy and will they pay? I disagree with that nowadays. I think you need to consider not only what they're positioning, but also what are you portraying to them about your own business? If we look at the simplistics of what I said a second ago, you know, a standard credit control process may well involve, amongst other things, verifying you know who you're actually dealing with you can take legal recovery action without any problems should it become necessary. I have seen umpteen businesses fall down by not actually understanding the identity of the party they're trading with. They've got their account set up as Mr. Smith Limited when actually it's Mr. Smith or vice versa, or perhaps it's an LLP or a partnership. You really need to understand who you're dealing with at the outset. Have you set a credit limit? I'm sure you would have done, but have you reviewed it recently? Do you stick to it? That is one of the biggest problems I see when companies fall into a form of insolvency, people are way beyond credit terms. The supplier has done nothing to actually stop that. Sometimes that's because of a breakdown between sales and credit control. People are out selling, but doesn't necessarily mean that they know not to go selling to that same client. It's a joined up thinking process that you need to be aware of. What about um, having strict payment and chasing policies? And even your terms and conditions about late payment interest and charges. Do you apply it? Do you even know what they are? Again, I've seen any number of businesses that have just got a policy that they set up years ago. The people that have come in have come and gone. There's new staff and nobody really knows what that policy is. You need to have that in place to apply consistently. You need to think about who is paying. Focus on those that are going to pay with the least effort or those that might be on the brink of potential collapse because getting something out of them now is far better than getting potentially nothing or much less much further down the line. Have monitoring systems in place. Again, I'm sure a lot of you do, but do have them in place. Do review their credit often. Check social media for a growing number of negative comments or other feedback about them. It's amazing what you can find via social media nowadays. Depending on your niche, depending on your customers, if possible, talk to them. Understand their pinch points and their forthcoming needs. Engage with them when they come into the branch. Find out what they're experiencing, what will help shape your 
business model, your resilience to work out what's critical, what's coming up, what do we need to factor in? What about your communication with them? Is it too often? Is it too little? What are you saying to them? Do you think you're building confidence in your ability to react or satisfy their needs by what you're saying? What about offers? Would it help to put offers in place to get forward orders from customers? I'm sure these are things you've all considered and thought a lot about more than I have. But it's amazing how often customers become our number one focus, looking at getting them to pay or getting them to come in the door, and you forget all the other factors. Marketing and sales. This is clearly closely linked to the point just made about customers. Just because they're not buying doesn't mean you should stop marketing. If you do stop marketing, people often think you've gone out of business. One thing I always do is if I can't get hold of a company or I'm just a bit curious, I'll go onto their website. The minute I read that copyright section that says 2018, 2017, any year but the current year, my automatic assumption is they're no longer trading. It's sometimes the smallest of details that make a difference between building that customer confidence and losing it within no time at all. I possibly think that we are entering a phase where price is no longer one of the most important factors. I think it is going to be the most important factor. So rather than being a race to the bottom, what can you do to set yourself apart? What about your processes and systems? We've all got them, but are they fit for purpose of what is about to come? Are there areas you've struggled with previously and have never really found the time to focus on? Well, now is the perfect time because a lot of us do have that free time to look at them. You know, you often have probably times where, oh, this hasn't quite gone right. This has caused me a headache because X hasn't happened and Y hasn't happened. Well, spend that time now understanding and resolving the problem that led to the X or the Y being an issue. It will really make your business able to thrive and deal with that deluge of inquiries that will hopefully be coming. Market changes. Has your market changed? I think for the vast majority, the answer is going to be yes. So what does it look like now? What do your customers look like? Have their priorities or the demographics shifted? Perhaps there's a new market for you now that wasn't there before. You know, the hire of certain items might be necessary to maintain social distancing or similar and could actually be an opportunity for you. Think about what your product or service does for your customer. Does it help them make money? Does it give them enjoyment? I mean, some people obviously like playing with gadgets more than others, but you know, why there does it take away a problem? Does it make their life easier? With any of those, think about what else you can possibly offer to make their life even easier. Anybody hiring anything nowadays will not just be thinking about, well, is it the cheapest? Is it the best? Does it serve the purpose? They'll have their own headaches of social distancing and other matters to worry about when they take those items on. So maybe just a simple checklist for them to go through to help them implement whatever they've hired from you might be a good idea. Now, whilst all these areas are important, if ultimately you haven't got the finance right and the finance to get you there, whether every other area is perfectly resilient, it becomes irrelevant. You won't survive. Now, we'll examine the financials further by looking at what is out there and then looking at practical considerations to maximise your cash flow. So, as we're all aware, the government decided back on the 23rd of March, we should all work from home wherever possible. And very soon thereafter announced a raft of measures. Now, I've split this down into two areas, the, the general business area and very briefly touching on the self-employed. Now, I appreciate the self-employed is probably not very relevant for the vast majority of you, other than, well, it does touch on the supplier side because you may well have subcontractors that are self-employed. So, looking onto the business side. Now, I don't propose to go through these in great detail. There's a lot of information out there and there are plenty of links towards the end, which we'll talk to you about when we get there. Um, you're also, of course, more than welcome to raise a question as we're going through about any of these or again at the end. So, but covering some of those items that are on there, um, recent changes, the job retention scheme. Now, I'm sure you're all very familiar with what it is and it's been there for quite a while now, but the recent changes that have just been announced, thought I'd quickly touch on those. We know from the 1st of July that part-time working will be allowed. You have to decide on the hours and the shifts that those people are going to do. Um, you must pay the staff for those hours. And for those part-timers, let me make it clear, it is part-time working, not part-time with lots of overtime, otherwise known as full-time working. It is part-time working. So just make sure you don't fall foul of the rules. You then go through to the 1st of August. 
from the 1st of August, the amount paid is remaining the same. It's the 80%, the maximum of the two and a half. But employers must, at that point, pay employers' national insurance contributions and pensions. Now, apparently, this will be on average 5% of the gross costs incurred had the employee not been furloughed. I've not done a calculation. I'm sure the government have got it right. But the point is, there's something to be paid. From the 1st of September, the percentage they will give you reduces from 80% to 70% as well as the maximum they will advance you being £2,187.50. The employer must again pay the national insurance and pension contributions, and then also 10% of wages. That's apparently going to be about 14% of your gross costs. From the 1st of October, it changes again. It then goes down from 70% to 60%. The maximum goes down further to £1,875 a month. And again, it's employers, national insurance and pension contributions to be paid by the employer, plus 20% of wages um, up to the maximum 80% cap. So there's quite a few changes coming along. That, again, may itself change as the weeks and months go by. You know, is there going to be a second wave? Who knows is the answer at this precise moment in time. We all sincerely hope not, but it is a bit of watch this space. Now, the scheme closes to your entrance on the 30th of June, so anybody you take on after that time, I'm sorry you can't put them on furlough if you do and something changes within you know, a very short space of time. However, if you've got a number of employees and you do need to make them redundant and you can't afford to, the Redundancy Payment Service, which is part of the insolvency service, does offer a scheme whereby they will, in essence, give you a loan to be able to afford to make those redundancies straight away. Now, it is a loan. They do expect you to be able to make it back and they're not going to give it to businesses where they think we will not get it back. They have to do that through a formal insolvency process. And in one sense, you go, well, it's daft. Why not give it to you in advance? Those are the rules. They just won't. They'll only give it to you if you think if they think that you're going to survive and be able to pay it back. I'm sure you're aware of the ability to defer VAT and income tax arrangements. VAT is the 30th of June. Your income tax is the next payment on account that's due. Anything beyond that, you're looking at a time to pay scheme with HM Revenue Customs. One of the links at the end will give you the phone number um, to, to call. With the time to pay arrangement, it is relatively straightforward. We can't afford, but we are a successful business. We will be okay in time. This is what we propose. Within reason, you'll get whatever you ask for, subject to you not taking the Michael and asking for 10 years to make a payment. But if you ask for 12 months, six months, they're not going to bat an eyelid. Statutory sick pay. Um, again, you know, I'm sure you can claim it back if workers are off sick due to COVID. Um, and you can claim both the job retention scheme payments and statutory sick pay, but you can't have that for the same period. There are local authority discretionary grants available. Um, these will come from your own local authority based on wherever you trade. Your business has to have less than 50 employees, has to have a fixed building cost such as renting premises, and you have to have been trading on the 11th of March 2020 also obviously have been adversely affected by coronavirus. You can apply, sorry, you cannot apply if you're already claiming a number of other funds. But if you're not, you can. Um, applying for this also doesn't stop you applying for other loans, such as the C-Bills loan. The amounts to be given as these local discretionary grants are 25,000, 10,000, and then any amount also under 10,000 pounds. So they're relatively small in the grand scheme of things, but in some circumstances, a little bit like the Tesco slogan, every little helps. You can also look at small business grant funding of up to £10,000. That is, a, you know, a small business that is paying little or no business rate is entitled to that. The grant, the income from that is taxable, and that may be too small for a lot of you, but it's there just in. The future fund is something that, whilst there's been a big uptake, I suspect won't be applicable to a lot of people. That's whereby you can get a convertible loan of between £125,000 and £5 million that has to be matched by funding from private investors. It must, you must have already raised £250,000 of equity in the last five years. Your shares cannot be traded in a regulated market and half of, or more of your employees must be UK based or you must generate your sales in the UK. I'm sure, again, moving on to the next one, you're familiar with the business interruption loan scheme. I won't go into that in great detail. Um, the bounce back loan is something that's a little more recent. But again, I'm sure that's been covered in the press. If you want to know more about that, we can cover it at the end. But that is one of the biggest things that's been um, in the news. Finally, if you've got a very large business, in terms of more than 45 million, you can look at the large business interruption loan. Again, don't propose to cover that in detail. We can read. On the additional support for self-employed individuals, I think the only one that is going to be applicable to most people really is the mortgage payment holiday. 
You can have a mortgage payment holiday of now up to six months, which takes you to the 30th of September. Um, bizarrely, you can apply for that even after the 30th of September, up until the 31st of October. Um, and you can also uh, be rest assured that if you do leave it, you don't ask for it before the 31st of October. The FCA have stopped mortgage repossessions being possible until the start of November. So there is a lot of leeway there. So that's good. So when you've looked at those financial options that are available and you've exhausted them um, and all the possibilities, you've got them, you haven't got them, what other actions and choices can you make in order to maximise your own cash and building up that financial resilience so you've got the building blocks for the future? Well, some of these things are really obvious, but again, these are things that I see time and time again. Have you invoiced all your clients for all the work done or can some still be invoiced? It amazes me how people just forget or just think, oh, I'll do it next week or next month. Well, that's just crazy in the current circumstances. Please do revisit and make sure you've invoiced everything. Um, you know, there may be items that you've just overlooked for whatever reason. Can you get a customer to pay early by another method? You're offering early settlement discounts may be a way of encouraging people to pay. Getting that cash in your bank might be better off than you paying finance. If you've you know, got some finance against it, like invoice discounts or an overdraft, it may actually cost you less to give that discount. Even where it doesn't, cash in your bank is better than it being in somebody else's. So see if you can do that. When it comes to payments by other methods, perhaps you do take Apple Pay, credit cards, or otherwise. Yeah, you can obviously take pretty large payments from credit cards. I appreciate that has its own risks in terms of chargebacks, but again, have you exhausted all those avenues to get cash in? Um, customers that haven't paid, is it worth getting onto a payment plan? plan? Again, if someone's not paying, having something rather than nothing is better. Having said that, do look at each customer individually. Don't put a customer on a payment plan who perhaps, if you'd left it three weeks, may have paid you in full when you just put them on a six-month payment plan. Do look at each customer individually, but sometimes getting something is far better than the potential of getting nothing. Speak to customers. Offer help. Even try to motivate them with an early settlement discount and it doesn't work. They might be willing to go on to that regular payment plan. And if that doesn't work, see what other help you can offer them. You know, I've found quite a lot in the past, customers and suppliers have worked, worked, worked really well together where they've been offered support. I mean, offering that support, it's amazing the relationship it builds up. And in building that relationship up, the best thing is you often somehow find your way to the top of the pile when it comes to payment. Again, anything you can do to help your customers, anything you can do to motivate them, even subtly to get them to pay you rather than somebody else, I'd be picking up the phone and having that chat. How about entering into a contra deal with your customer suppliers? This means that no cash needs to flow between either of you. The only real financial headache of the coronavirus is the need for money to keep flowing around the system. If we could stop that need, none of us would have a problem anywhere in our financial lives, our businesses, our personal lives at all. It's the need to keep it flowing around the system that's causing the problem. So, well, you could enter into contra deals. You know, for example, a roofer that needs a cherry fixer, but you've got a problem with your own roof. A cherry picker, sorry, fixer, cherry picker. You may be able to let them have it in return for them fixing your roof, all free of charge to both of you. Just something to think about. May not work in all scenarios, but again, it just helps. Charging for delivery or scrapping next day delivery. Again, I've seen a lot of people moving on to delivery charges where it's been free because it's just an additional cost that you really need to cover. And even scrapping next day delivery, because it's so difficult, people are stretched for their resources. Scrapping it means the costs are lower for you if you are giving that as part of your service. Setting up mail redirection onto the next slide, you know, to redirect posts to your accounts manager's home rather than the office might mean checks received earlier and banked earlier and cleared earlier. All these things are relatively simple. Have you moved people onto electronic payments? I had a conversation only a few days ago with a particular um, company who said, we've got 400 odd pounds for you on one of your um, insolvencies. Fantastic. If I give you the bank details, can you, you know, pay it to the bank? No, we've got to send it by check. Very surprised, very old fashioned, but for, for me, didn't really matter. But actually, if I desperately needed that, that's another five or six days. Might be the same for you. Get them onto electronic payments. See payment holidays from your rent, for example, your landlord. You know, you're in a very strong position at this moment in time. Landlords could do very little towards you if you don't pay your rent. But negotiate one. It's far better. Leaves a better taste in everybody's mouth and means you'll get more goodwill in the future. What about reducing working hours? When people come back, it's going to be a really funny world. And Do you need them to work those full hours that they would have done before? 
it might be within your contracts to reduce their hours. And I really would think about doing it. You'd be surprised how when you do that, people tend to give you the same amount of work anyway, or they do in my experience. Have you got idle or dilapidated equipment that you really don't need? You're selling it, getting that cash in the bank might be a good idea. You may not get a great uh, amount for it, but on the other hand, you're incurring costs at the moment to insure it, to store it, to move it potentially from place to place. Well, just sell it. You'll be probably far better off. Communicate openly and honestly with your teams. I really find this makes a difference. You know, people are worried about their position. People are worried about their jobs. If you're open and honest with them, explain the financial position. They've got their own self-interest. We want to make sure we have jobs. They will work for you. But if you keep them in the dark, all that that breeds is suspicion. And suspicion breeds to, I'll start looking for another job or I'll move on at the earliest opportunity. Bring that loyalty on board. You know, communicate, get them into the team. Give standardised messages to customers and suppliers. You'll be surprised how simple this is and how so many people will get it wrong. If you leave it to certain people in certain departments, you know, Mr Smith will say X and Mrs Jones will say Y and your customers and suppliers are going, wow, we don't really understand. We thought it was this, now we think it's that. Just draft that and it saves your employees time and effort in thinking about what to be saying. How do we approach this? What do we put on an email? Well, copy and paste, there you go. Very simple thing to build that confidence and aid that cash flow. Um, you can then see whether, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see whether there are existing funders that represent the best value for you at the moment. You know, you would be surprised, actually, whilst obtaining finance isn't as easy as it used to be, the businesses that will get the finance, it's very competitive out there. Funders want your business. They've got to keep generating their own income. So, you know, do have a look and consider. Report more frequently on your numbers. Sounds obvious. Amaze the people that have made no changes at all. Oh, we get it from our accountants at the end of the year. We get it with six months every quarter. That's no good in today's world. You need it far more frequent than that. If you ask me, potentially weekly, at least monthly, you've got to report, you need to understand. Don't hide from your existing lenders. The worst thing you can do is coming back to that, no news is, is bad news in essence, um, and suspicion, communicate with them. If you tell them there's a problem, you'll be amazed at how much they will support you at this moment in time. They don't want a bad debt as much as you don't want a bad debt. Don't hide from them, speak to them, they will support you. I can give you any number of examples where that's happened. Um, and even where they've given additional funding. I had that many years ago where the bank gave a second overdraft facility. It was bizarre. I don't know how we achieved it. I'm very grateful, but you would be surprised. And don't be scared to ask. Again, you will be amazed at the support people will give you, but you've got to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. Speak to obviously HAE or EHA, you know, them and their own financing broking facility, they will have the opportunity to you know, give you additional deals, give you something that may, you may not find in the marketplace elsewhere. Finally, I'll talk about scrutinizing overheads and categorizing them. You know, it's amazing how people don't do this. It's really simple um, and makes a huge difference to what you spend and the profit or loss and the cash that's going to be in the bank. So quickly look at scrutinizing overheads. I would say you need to break those down to areas. You know, what do you need to survive? That's absolutely essential. If you don't have it, the business will fall over or we're just going to break the law. Insurance, for example. Look at those ones that are perhaps painful to expend or painful to chop, but you can chop them, albeit your business will be impacted, but you know, maybe it's a necessity. Let's look at those areas of spend where you can get a better return on. For example, we had a bookkeeper. Well, maybe outsourcing that is better, more cost effective for you. Maybe we do our own HR. Again, is outsourcing that better for you? Um, what about the spend that you could defer? Defer whatever you can at this moment in time, if you ask me. Why not have the cash in your bank to build up that resilience to come back much stronger? Finally, there are things that we all spend money on that we just don't need. So chop them, cut them out. How do you prioritise between those five categories? It's quite simple. Number one, ignore your survival spend. Just ignore it because it's necessary. Secondly, chop all your wasted spend. Get rid of it without thinking twice. The other three points, you can chop and change as appropriate for you, but I would say defer payments wherever possible, keep the cash for you, then work on your efficiency spends because that's going to give you a longer term gain, and then review what I've called the trauma spend, the things that, well, we possibly could chop but might give us a bit of pain. When it then comes to looking at your forward financial position, your cash flow, you need one. Now, you need to prepare your most likely and your worst case scenarios. Um, Paul, if we could just 
click on a couple of slides, sorry. Um, yeah, your, your most likely and your worst case. Your most likely is not your best case, it is your realistic possibility. What is going to happen? That's what you need to do. This is about cash, not profit. You don't need it to show profit. You don't need it to be tied into a lovely fancy balance sheet. It can be as simple as the one that is on the screen. It is literally what is coming in, what is going out, when is it going out? Do this daily, weekly, monthly if need be, but I would say weekly, potentially daily, especially if you're in a position of severe financial stress. It needs to be daily. Um, as you'll see, the important points to note are that, for example, doing this, you can see that come period four, that's when oh, we suddenly have a cash flow need. We need to find more finance. We can then see in period five, that's the maximum we need. Oh, and then in period six, we can see it starts to come down. So we can take some comfort that we only need it for a very short space of time. Obviously, this will look very different for your own business. Um, what that might also allow you to then do is to go back through and recategorize those expenses earlier and say, oh, maybe we can chop a bit, maybe we can spare a bit. But do it, please do it, and please do it um, as quickly as possible and do it frequently. Now, before leaving with the links to um, to look at, I thought there might be a few myths that I could probably just bust because you know these are things that I hear time and time again that are all related to resilience. In the news at the moment, wrongful trading has been suspended. All will be OK for every business owner. No, it won't. Wrongful trading is one of about 10 things that if your company does happen to fall over, I could come along or any insolvency practitioner come along and have a pop at you for. Just ignore the headlines. It's really false that all is OK because of that. It just isn't got to act appropriately and as a director you've got statutory duties i hear people say take the bounce back loan and don't repay it there are no consequences the government don't like not getting paid back so trust me if that happens and the business falls over you may be looking at disqualification and in from disqualification the government can look at what's called a compensation order to get their money back and that'll be against the director personally so again people say do this there are consequences um i've been threatened with court proceedings that's the end panic it isn't the end at all the threat of court proceedings doesn't mean you're going to have a judgment against you. doesn't mean your company is going to get wound up. Depending on what they're threatening to sue you for, they actually won't get anything at this moment in time because there are so many court processes that have been deferred. So, again, don't panic if someone threatens you. Cybersecurity and hacking only affects the big firms. You know, it affects firms of all sizes. And that's not the simple things of, oh, somebody's hacked into our website, somebody's hacked into our, our, our um, banking system. It can be the simple things like someone's hacked into our data, stolen it, and now we've got the embarrassment of going telling all of our customers that we've lost their data, which will destroy your business potentially overnight, not just from the loss of goodwill, from the fine the ICO will impose, because as I'm sure you're aware, that will sink many businesses when it's you know, potentially a percentage of worldwide turnover or a minimum of a very, very big number. Um, the man down the pub or my mate said, if I had a pound for every time somebody said that to me, it would be wonderful. Um, your mate down the pub is not regulated. They're not licensed. They're not qualified. They probably haven't even been through it themselves. And just because it applies to their circumstances doesn't mean it applies to yours. You need proper professional qualified advice. If for no other reason than if someone gets it wrong, you want to rely upon somebody else's professional indemnity policy and not your mate down the pub. Um, and then finally, people always say, well, if I come and speak to Kevin Lucas, it means my business is going bust and always horribly wrong. No, it doesn't. If we go back to all the things that Paul kindly said at the start, speaking to me is about I have a concern with my business doesn't mean it's a problem. We spoke to another HEE member recently, and I have to say from their perspective, it was very much a case of this person has done this. We think it might be good for us. And I had to sit there and say, no, I think it's the worst thing for you. I think we need to look at something else, which is not a formal insolvency process. Again, I am a licensed insolvency practitioner, but it doesn't mean that is the answer to your problems. And sometimes it's just reassurance for people. So, you know, if anybody wants to speak to me, it doesn't mean your business is going bust and doesn't mean it's the end of the world. So there we go. Um, the final slide um, is uh, there's a link um, to the ICAEW website. And the next one on there is this document, which is quite useful. Um, we haven't got a direct link to this, but it is on there. The link on the next page takes you to many more pieces of information on the ICAEW's website, which is the Institute of Chartered Accountants, along with another a number of links. I'll just add very briefly at the bottom, be the business. I found this really quite useful and interesting. I've got to say, I found it by complete chance. But that particular link takes you to a number of sound bites that have been recorded with business owners that are going through issues at the moment and what they've seen, and also 
what they've done about it. I found it really quite interesting. It may just give you some useful hints and tips from people that are in similar positions, not necessarily the same industry, but just we're all business owners. We've all got financial concerns, all concerns about employees, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really quite different, but quite interesting. Um, so there we go. Bit of a whistle stop tour. I do appreciate. Um, but happy to take questions here, obviously, um, or, uh, or after the event. Um, my colleague's details are on the slide, Phil Ross. That's not because you can't get hold of me, um, but Phil is uh, Phil is happy to help you out because Phil's quite well known to HAE and has had a long relationship with them. So a number of you might know him in any event. Um, and Paul, thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Kevin, thank you very much for taking us through your presentation. We have received a couple of questions. Uh, as I say, we are recording this webinar and we'll share it with others uh, and it will go on our website and um, our marketing manager will, will make sure that as many people get to hear and see and, and find out what uh, what we discussed today. Just two questions I've, I've got here that have been sent in. So the first one is, we've planned and reviewed, but we just don't know what is going to happen. At what point should we start to worry? Is there a oh. magic formula? Oh, if only. If only there was. <laughs> Um, <laughs> tough one, tough one. There we go. Yeah, no, if you if you planned or reviewed, I suppose yeah, it's the best you can do. What is going to happen, and when we should, should we start to worry about things? I think what is going to happen is if someone's got that magic crystal ball that's got the batteries in, please do let me know because I quite like it as well. It is all very uncertain, and it's a very much a case of sit and watch. And depending on which sort of area of high you're in, you know, you might be looking at this thinking, well, actually, we're getting back to work. People are starting to come in. We're starting to hire things out. And for those that may be in events, you're looking at it and going, well, we're going to be doing nothing until the summer of next year, potentially. And so, you know, where should you start to worry or when should you start to worry? If you're doing those regular reviews, you're building the resilience in, you're looking at your financials and you're exhausting all those avenues to get the cash. But your forecasts are saying, well, we think we're going to be really short come X, Y, Z. Well, then that is a conversation of, well, what mechanisms can we do to defer that short period? And that might be coming back to those categories of spend. Look at them again. Are there things that are in there that we think we have to pay, but we can defer? Perhaps we need to get into a formal deferral arrangement. There are many formal deferral arrangements. You know, there's one under the Insolvency Act, but there's also just the, to be perfectly honest, the common sense approach, which is, dear supplier, we're in this position. We think we need a bit more time. What do you think? And see what the supplier says um everybody's in the same boat so people will understand but yeah there is no magic formula apart from review 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 and build that resiliency in as best you can now okay thanks for that kevin so another interesting one here are there plenty of options to save my company if things really do go south um yes there are um i think again you know coming back to the say that the member we spoke to recently uh, they weren't quite in the position where things were going south, but they were concerned because, again, well, we think this is how our future is going to look, but we're not really too sure. We've thrown a few, you know, look at the, the best or sorry, the most likely, the worst case scenario and at the worst case scenario we can see. And then you get into, well, OK, well, how have you fared your budgeting you've been doing? How have you fared against that? Shows your budgeting is actually not too bad. You've been quite good at predicting. So don't think you need it. But if things are really looking south, Yes, there are always options. You know, if anybody comes to see us, whether they're at the start of a decline curve, they're at the bottom of the decline curve, there are always things we can do to rescue that situation and rescue that that individual's business, the baby they've probably worked on for the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, what that rescue looks like may be very different from one to another, but there are always options and you know, never say never. Uh, and I think going back to one of the things I said before, sometimes it's just about reassurance. Things may not be as bad as you think. Easy for me to say, I know it's not my baby and my business, but I've seen enough companies and enough businesses over my time that I'd like to think I've got a pretty good idea of whether it is terminal or not. Um, and if it isn't, I'm not going to be telling you otherwise. I'll give you the good news that you might be seeking. Fantastic. Are there any other questions for Kevin before we before we round up the, the, the webinar? Uh... I can see two people might be typing. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of people typing there. So let's see see how they uh, see how they come on. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's really interesting, Kevin. In terms of that that, that conversation, there are lots of different uh, uh, options out there for um, um, uh, people to, to to find out about. It's not it's not it's not a failure. 
finding out information to see how they can support the businesses that people have invested their time and uh they uh, you know they 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 just want specialist advice and that and that and that's yeah. I think that's essential really in, in, in the current climate as you've as you mentioned. Fantastic. Right. Kevin, thanks very much for that. I mentioned this, this webinar is part of a series that HE have introduced to support members. I'm absolutely delighted to say that we have a further webinar taking place tomorrow. That's Friday the 5th of June at 11 a.m. This will focus on supporting employees and businesses with working from home or remotely and managing employees through a crisis. It will be delivered by HE Business Guard, who are working in partnership with Stellard Kane Associates. And also just a reminder, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, um, we, uh, we have our e-learning uh, platform up and running now. And as we're recording this webinar, the first two modules are live and we will be uh, putting together an e-learning uh, package based around this particular webinar and the one tomorrow. If you contact uh, my colleague, Nikki, uh, and she'll be able to help with that. And also just, as you mentioned already, Kevin, if, if people are wanting further information from, from yourselves, uh, if they contact Phil, his details are on the screen, uh, we will send out a recording of this, uh, this uh, for people who've uh, uh, taken part and in, uh, expressed an interest, and we will put this on the website for people to uh, to hear. Uh, some uh, some good uh, messages coming there. Thanking you, Kevin, uh, for for the work. Thanks everyone for for uh, contributing with that. Unless there's anything else, I'd just like to thank Kevin for his, his work and support and assistance in doing this, and our colleagues at the association, uh, and in particular for getting this webinar online ready for us. And if there's nothing more to say, stay safe, everybody, and thank you. So thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Goodbye.